Hi folks! This is a video I've wanted to do since I started the channel, and selected by Twitter followers, the elitism of classical music. I don't mean anything intrinsic in the music itself, whatever that may mean, and I don't mean the historic aristocracy that supported so much of classical music when it was first commissioned and performed. I mean the elitism that exists in our modern era, in the ways classical music is talked about, performed, and taught. Not everyone who enjoys classical music sets out to perpetuate this elitism, but lots of people do, whether they know it or not. To listen to classical music in the traditional mode of disinterested contemplation requires a heck of a lot of practice and experience. In short, you have to know a lot of set patterns and expectations of the various genres and styles that make up classical music. While many things in our era mean that listening to classical music doesn't have to be expensive, the traditional mode of listening does require a lot of time. There's also a very traditional way of teaching classical music. Quizzing a group when a teacher plays this music. And then says, who can tell me what this piece is? Assuming that everyone will know. I've stopped doing this in my teaching practice because I found that only a few students generally get these kind of repertoire quizzes, and it's always the same students. Why does the perception of elitism of classical music survive today? And worse than that, how and why are so many values of elitism manifest in the modern classical music sphere? In this video, we're going to explore a bit. Full disclosure, I grew up in a comfortable enough environment, musically speaking. Family members played, my mum taught music in the local school, and it was normal to be thinking about or listening to classical music in my childhood home. My school offered free and discounted instrument and music lessons which got me to where I am today. Those schemes are now gone, by the way. The situation I'll be talking about in this video is very different to the one I grew up with. I'm talking a lot about the UK situation because that's my working environment, but the scenario plays out across just about every country. In so many ways, it's never been easier or cheaper to access classical music. The internet, that great liberator, has made millions of recordings and videos accessible at the drop of a hat, and lots of opera houses and concert halls now offer tickets for the price of a cinema ticket, sometimes cheaper. But different surveys of classical music listeners tell us different things. It's going back nearly 10 years now, but a 2012 survey for YouGov found that 80% of British adults had some sort of relationship with classical music. A 2019 media survey found that 25 to 34 year olds made up 31% of the classical music streaming audience, and 60% of the total audience for classical music streaming were under 55, so not the stereotypical audience of retired people. The same survey found that classical music was the fourth most popular genre across all adults. So that's one thing, the basic lowest possible costs of just being interested in classical music as a listener. How about in social attitudes? This is something much harder to measure, but here's a taster. London's Royal Opera House ran an article about how people should dress for the opera. Spoiler alert! Dress however you want, so long as there's no nudity or obscenity. Anyway, the comments section for this article was interesting. Clive writes, If people can afford the eye-watering opera prices and, to a lesser extent, the cost of a ballet ticket, they can afford to dress sufficiently well not to cause offence. I am not talking black tie, but shorts and vest and the expensive bar is not acceptable to many people on their special evening out. That must be really hard, Clive. Valeria writes, I do hope that opera dress code will remain conservative. People should be beautiful in every way, in their faces, in the way they dress, in their thoughts, and in their innermost selves. Anton Chekhov. And Hannah writes, We always dress up. It's a special occasion. It's what my parents taught me to do, to be respectful, and it's a lovely evening out. Why wouldn't you when you're spending that much money on a seat? People have no standards these days. 
it's these kind of attitudes that makes classical music elitist. The idea that it is better than other music, more sophisticated, more spiritual somehow. Another spoiler, it isn't. Why is there this idea that classical music is just better? It ties to the old idea of self-improvement in classical music. I've put in the hours listening to hundreds or thousands of pieces so I know better than you. To listen to and enjoy classical music, there's an all-pervasive idea that you need to have listened to a lot of it to begin understanding it. In some ways this is true, but not that much. You can still enjoy music no matter what, and there aren't rules for how you enjoy something. Studying classical music, though, is extraordinarily expensive. In the UK there are some free schemes and some bursaries and scholarships, but the far majority of, pe of young people studying classical music in an academic context are from a privileged background. That's just a fact. Want proof? Around 7% of UK children attend private school where fees are paid. Sometimes those fees are comparable to US college tuition, but that lasts up to 12 or even 15 years. Average fees are £17,000 a year, so that's uh, $23,500. Some schools charge less, some charge a lot more. Around one third of all children in private schools receive some kind of bursary or discount off their fees. Only 1.5% of children across these institutions receive a full scholarship. The rest have to pay something. The far majority pay a lot. Remember, 7% of the population are in these paid private schools. Small class sizes, excellent facilities for music. Yet at conservatoires and high-ranking traditional style music departments, private school students tend to make up about 50% of all student enrolment. A lot more than that in some institutions, I should add. That's more than the average across Oxford and Cambridge, which are frequently in the news being criticised for their lack of representation of non-private school students. But it gets worse. Going back to younger children, the UK Musicians' Union found that children in families with a combined income of less than £28,000 a year were half as likely to study any kind of instrument than children from families earning £48,000 or more. Learning classical music is an expensive hobby. With the rapid demise of free school schemes, instrumental learning is something increasingly privatised and paid for by families themselves. Of course, Children and students can't help which economic class they're born into, so it's not students' fault. But on a social sense, it's a reflection of just how much we fail in wider social education around classical music. So the elitism surrounding classical music is manifest in who studies it, and their economic background. Does this explain the social attitudes to it as well? The perception that it is a music primarily for and produced by the privileged. Well, yes, it's theory time. Theory time! Come on and grab your friends! Sociology theory, specifically. I'm lifting a concept from Pierre Boudot, sociologist extraordinaire. Boudot theorised something that he called cultural capital. In the way that rich people might own capital in the form of property, there is a kind of cultural property that we own, and that is a marker of privilege and wealth. These social assets help those with the cultural capital to achieve social mobility in a stratified society. The upper and middle classes have a kind of knowledge of cultural matters that marks them as distinct and separate from the lower and working classes. How does this work? Well, Parents in upper and middle class families tell their children how to behave at the theatre. Basic concepts of what opera or performance really are, what to listen for in classical music, etc. These things are not widely taught on school curricula anymore, so they are left for informal education at home. Skip forward 20 years, and little Claire knows not to talk during a concert at the Symphony Hall, but little Jimmy doesn't know this. He talks, and the audience around him are annoyed at him. Professor of Sociology Les Back gives a brilliant quote to sum up cultural capital even better. Here, he asks a prison inmate taking a remote degree course what his favourite reading has been. 
Simon started studying sociology as part of an open university program. His enthusiasm and love of ideas is immediately evident. I ask him if he has a favourite author or set of ideas. It would have to be Pierre Boudin. You know his thing about cultural capital. I mean, all the boys came up to visit me. I says to them, what the middle classes have got is not money. No, it's what they give their kids. Cultural capital. They take them to the opera. They teach them how to study. You can't buy it and you can't steal it from them. This is what is taking place in many, many spheres of classical music. A nurturing and celebration of cultural capital that threatens to exclude anyone who isn't already aware of an intricate web of audience behaviours, listening practices, and all the other complex ins and outs of classical music. Has it always been this way, though? Well, no. The early 20th century saw mass programmes to spread interest in classical music. Professor Alexandra Wilson, in her brilliant book Opera in the Jazz Age, writes on these campaigns. There was an early 20th century working class intelligentsia that, motivated by an ethos of self-improvement, was keenly interested in all kinds of high culture. Mining communities gave a warm welcome to touring opera companies, for example. A hard-fought battle took place during the 1920s about whether various forms of culture were highbrow, lowbrow, or that newly invented thing, middlebrow. The period after the First World War, which saw the emergence of the suburban middle classes in the sense that we mean the term today, together with the expansion of the mass culture industry and a modern type of celebrity, would establish ways of thinking about cultural hierarchies that have had long-lasting implications. In the 1920s and 1930s, the UK government sought to promote classical music to the wider population, and it essentially worked. There were subscription programmes, giving detailed notes for listening to a radio series, or vinyl records that you received in the post. Classical music was one of the most broadly consumed genres right up until the 1950s. Cut 30 years to the 1980s, and most families weren't listening to classical music regularly. Lots still were, make no mistake, but not all. By the time we get into the 21st century, and music education services start getting cut, we end up with large sections of the population never encountering classical music, except in places like film and television music, or piped into calm customers in McDonald's restaurants. The critic Charlotte Gill sparked mild outrage in 2017, when she wrote that music education, as it is still clinging on in the UK, should have abandoned traditional notation, or that it could focus primarily on teaching popular music. There's a bigger conversation to be had on this subject, one for another video, I think, but I'm going to leave on this point. If we only teach popular music in schools, then the only students familiar with classical music at all will be the privileged few paying for private lessons. The idea is well-intentioned, but it's the exact opposite of accessibility. As Ian Pace wrote in response, the removal of core musical skills from state education can only reinforce the privilege that is already fostering elitism in music. What's the answer? Well, better funding for schools, more arts programming for TV and radio, the BBC do great work but there's always more, and calling out negative depictions and attitudes whenever we hear them from classical music audiences, musicians, and yes, musicologists. Your snootiness is what perpetuates the elitism of classical music. Anyone can enjoy classical music. I stress you don't have to. I'm not saying everyone has to, but anyone can enjoy it. It's not classical music that's elitist. It's the majority of the people who enjoy classical music. Damn classical music fans. They ruined classical music. Okay, thanks for watching. Comment, like, subscribe if you enjoyed this video. Check out some of my others. Please leave a comment suggestions for further videos you'd like to see on this channel. Okay, thanks. Bye. <laughs>